The world is full of amazing people. From rags to riches tales, to survival against the odds, the true stories out there are rich and varied, incredible accounts to marvel at and be inspired by. Knowing that these events actually happen to someone leaves you with a deeper sense of awe, no wonder, then, that true story books are so popular. Immersing ourselves in other people's lives is a way to find meaning, insight, and joy. Memoirs make us think, challenge our perceptions, and uplift us in our darkest moments. Here are some bizarre and amazing stories that will surely put you in awe. Violet Constance Jessup was an Argentinian ocean liner stewardess, memoirist, and nurse who is known for having survived the sinkings of RMS Titanic in 1912 and her sister ship HMHS Britannic in 1916. In addition, she had been on board RMS Olympic, the eldest of the three sister ships, when it collided with a British warship, HMS Hawk, in 1911. She is often called the Queen of Sinking Ships, as well as Miss Unsinkable. Born on October 2, 1887, near Bahia Blanca, Argentina, Violet Constance Jessup was the oldest daughter of Irish immigrants William and Catherine Jessup. At age 21, her first stewardess position was with the Royal Mail Line aboard the Orinoco in 1908. In 1911, Jessup began working as a stewardess for the White Star vessel RMS Olympic. Olympic was a luxury ship that was the largest civilian liner at that time. Jessup was on board on September 20, 1911, when Olympic left from Southampton and collided with the British warship HMS Hawk. There were no fatalities and, despite the damage, the ship was able to make it back to port without sinking. She continued to work on Olympic until April 1912, when she was transferred to sister ship Titanic. Jessup boarded RMS Titanic as a stewardess on April 10, 1912, at age 24. Four days later, on April 14, it struck an iceberg in the North Atlantic and sank about two hours and 40 minutes after the collision. Jessup described in her memoirs how she was ordered up on deck to serve as an example of how to behave for the non-English speakers who could not follow the instructions given to them. She watched as the crew loaded the lifeboats. She was later ordered into lifeboat 16, and as the boat was being lowered, one of Titanic's officers gave her a baby to look after. The next morning, Jessup and the rest of the survivors were rescued by the RMS Carpathia and taken to New York City on April 18. During the First World War, Jessup served as a stewardess for the British Red Cross. On the morning of November 21, 1916, she was on board HMHS Britannic, the younger sister ship of Titanic that had been converted into a hospital ship, when it sank in the Aegean Sea after an explosion caused by a deep sea mine. Britannic sank within 55 minutes, killing 30 of the 1,066 people on board. While Britannic was sinking, Jessup and other passengers were nearly killed by the ship's propellers that were sucking lifeboats under the stern. Jessup had to jump out of her lifeboat, resulting in a traumatic head injury which she survived. Jessup died of congestive heart failure in 1971 at the age of 83. On the night of December 20, 1980, 19-year-old Jean Hilliard was driving to her parents' home in Langby, Minnesota, along a country road. While on the way, her car slid off the road and became stuck in a ditch. Instead of waiting for help, she decided to walk a few miles to her friend's house in the below 25-degree weather. She was hardly dressed for the cold weather, with just a jacket, pants, and cowboy boots. As she continued to walk, the heat was leaving her body. After an hour, she made it to her friend's house. However, before she could reach the door, she collapsed due to the cold. The following morning, Jean was discovered frozen solid and near death in her friend's front yard. Hilliards was so stiff that Nelson and his friend could not place her body in the cab of his pickup truck. They were forced to take his friend's vehicle instead. Nelson and his friend carefully put Hillard into the vehicle and drove her to the nearest hospital. The hospital was located in Faustin which was approximately a 10-minute drive away from Nelson's home. The physicians who initially saw Hilliard's condition did not believe that she had any chance of survival. 
Hilliard's skin was frozen so solid they were unable to pierce it with a hypodermic needle. The needles they used would break on contact. Her body temperature was so low that they couldn't get a reading from a thermometer. Hilliard's eyes didn't respond to any changes in light and her face was an ashen gray color. The medical staff decided to gradually warm Hilliard's body with heating pads even though they believed she was dead. Doctors eventually determined Hilliard's temperature was 88 degrees. This is 10 degrees less than what is considered normal. After waiting some time, the medical staff detected a faint pulse. It was only 12 beats per minute, but doctors believed it was possible that Hillard was actually still alive. The attending physician believed she was dead, but he heard a faint whimper. He realized this person was fighting for her life. But the outlook appeared grim. If she survived at all, it was likely she'd come out of it with possible brain damage or a double leg amputation. A hospital worker contacted her pastor and told her about Jean's condition. A prayer chain began throughout the area, by the end of the day, more than 30 people were praying for her. Just two hours after the chain began, Jean went into violent spasms. This was a good sign that her life was returning to her. However, doctors were still not optimistic. The next day, despite the seriousness of her frostbite, she awoke. Everything seemed to be fine with her mind and body. It was soon clear that nothing would have to be amputated from her and that she would recover. After 49 days in the hospital and in defiance of everything known about frostbite, Jean was released. Since then, she has made an astonishing recovery and has suffered no later ill effects. Jean is now married and a mother with three children. A woman, who chooses to be known only as Brianna, explained how excessive energy drink consumption led to her husband's nearly fatal brain hemorrhage. Brianna said that her husband, Austin, began to consume energy drinks when he started working longer hours and commuting. And, eventually, this proved life-threatening. I still remember my mother-in-law waking me up that morning, Austin had an accident, she said. All I knew was that my husband was in the hospital. The worst part? I didn't know why. She quickly learned that Austin had had a brain hemorrhage and that he was in a coma. After conducting a toxicology screening and ruling out drugs, doctors suggested that excessive energy drink consumption was the source of the problems. Austin then endured a number of brain surgeries, as well as unexpected strokes, seizures, and swelling of the brain. It was presumably during these surgeries that doctors removed the frontal portion of Austin's skull. Meanwhile, at that point, Brianna was already nine months pregnant with her and Austin's first child. I'm not going to lie to anyone, it was so hard. I had planned on Austin being a part of this huge moment, Brianna said. Being by my side. Holding my hand. Being there to cut the cord. Being there to welcome our son into the world. It didn't feel right, but a beautiful miracle happened as I delivered our son. Austin woke up, though he had emerged from his coma, Austin still had a long recovery ahead of him. I prepare the meals, do physical therapy, speech therapy, and occupational therapy. I help him with personal hygiene. I help him walk. I help him with every aspect of his life. Despite these obstacles, the couple is still persevering. We are fighting to help him recover. To make his life better. One day we will get there. Until then, I will never give up on him. Because love is selfless, and I love him more than life itself, Brianna said.